Welcome everyone to today's forum. Dr. Francine Steinberg will discuss nutrition and health issues and insights. Today's presentation is being recorded and it will be available for viewing later on the Renaissance Society webpage. If you're used to Zoom meetings, um, this is a little bit different. The chat feature in this webinar has been disabled and we ask that you please submit your questions through the Q&A feature, which is um, the button on your screen. If you have questions, um, please, uh, in your questions, state what it is in reference to. Uh, Dr. Steinberg is going to be covering a lot of materials, and uh, it sometimes can be confusing when a question comes in, what exactly the person's asking about. So if you specify your subject, um, you will increase the chances that your question will actually get answered. So Dr. Francine Steinberg is a profession, I'm sorry, professor of nutrition and chairperson of the Department of Nutrition at the University of California, Davis. She's a registered dietitian who practiced clinically for several years before earning her PhD. She currently teaches graduate and undergraduate students and conducts research on foods and food components that reduce risk factors for cardiovascular and other chronic diseases. Her specific areas of interest include metabolic effects of bioactive food compounds and their impact on health biomarkers. Dr. Steinberg has published over 50 research articles and has received the California Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Excellence in Research Award. Dr. Steinberg will be talking about nutrition and heart health issues and insights. She will thus discuss some common questions about how to achieve a healthy diet and provide evidence about the benefits of wide, wise food choices. So ladies and gentlemen of the Renaissance Society, please welcome Dr. Francine Steinberg. All right, well, thank you very much for that wonderful in introduction. And I'm really happy to be here today um, this is a topic that I think is personal for everybody. We all eat, and hopefully um, most of you recognize the link between what we eat and health, but there's lots of enthusiasm for it today, lots of information available, and so what I will do today is present to you some general background and some information that helps you to sort out the facts from what may not be so solid facts. So as a description of what we're going to talk about, it's briefly listed here. We'll talk very briefly about some nutrition basics, the relationship of um, nutrition to health, and I'll be focusing on heart health for the most part for this talk. We'll talk a little bit about cardiovascular risk factors, and lifestyle and its impact on heart health. And then we'll spend most of the time talking about healthy diet patterns, talk about some different uh, common nutrition issues and questions, uh, focus a little bit on some biologic mechanisms, and then try to translate that back into what can we personally do to put the science into action for our own health. So let's jump right into it. Um, so I think everybody has ideas about what they feel is healthy, um, and of course, we're getting bombarded with lots of information in the public sphere about what we should eat, what we shouldn't eat. And so there's lots of opinions and there's lots of, of answers. There's no one set right or wrong answer. So before we go any further, what I'd like to do is just to get a little bit of information from you. So we'll do a couple polls. The first one is on what does a healthy diet mean to you? and just some sort of opinion type of things. And then it will help me to know a little bit more about what to emphasize as I go through the talk to know what you want to know more about. So we'll launch the polls here and um, then go through what you are telling us. So these are our uh, multiple choice polls and just 
go ahead and place your answers. The first one is, what does a healthy diet mean to you? Click all that apply. The second one is, I want to know more about and click all that apply. So we're getting a variety of responses, lots of participants. Looks like we've got about two thirds of you. So as the last of you record your responses, we'll get the results to you in just a minute. All right, so it looks like we have the results here. I will talk through them. The first question was, what does a healthy diet mean to you? It looks like 95% of you said a variety of foods. So yay, everybody, good. 4% um, said boring, no fun foods. And, and I wanted to make sure that was in there because there is a fair perception out there in the public that eating healthy means you can't have any fun foods, good foods. And uh, for some people that means ice cream and for some people it means other things, but um, a healthy diet includes lots of different choices, including fun foods. 40% uh, of you said a healthy diet is delicious, which on the flip side means that 60% think maybe a healthy diet can't be delicious. Um, so hopefully we'll be, get a chance to talk about that. And 17% of you said no meats go into a healthy diet. So in other words, a healthy diet, you have to cut out meats. And, um, and that's something we can certainly talk about as we get to talk about vegetarian diets or not. Um, let's see, the second item, second question is I want to know more about. And the one that everybody wants to know more about, two thirds of you, want to know more about heart healthy fats. So I will touch on that. And if I don't answer enough of your questions, then be sure to pose them in the Q&A. Uh, looks like then um, the next one is 41% wanna know about Mediterranean diet. So we'll talk about that and components of it. Um, about a third of you wanna know about strategies to lower sodium. We will talk about that. Fermented foods, that's in there too. Eggs and cholesterol, 34%, phytonutrients, 28%, and 17% DASH diet. So it looks like many of you had a clue, had a great clue about what I was going to talk about because I have slides that touch on all of those things. So I'm glad to know that hopefully it'll be relevant for what you're interested in. And let's just go on into the rest of the talk. Um, so I'm going to stop, share the results and well, maybe I won't. there we go. Okay. So let's move forward. Um, so brief nutrition 101, why it's, a, why is nutrition important? Well, um, part of it is that food is delicious. It's a wonderful part of our life and it's a very social event with friends and family. And so it's important to be able to enjoy foods. They also have a lot of cultural, ethnic, religious meetings to various people. So those are all part of the, the social aspects of food. And it's also true that foods fuel our body. So we need them for energy, for essential nutrients and so forth. But many of the reasons why we eat are because not only are we feeling hungry physically, but we want to enjoy it. We want to do it as part of a group setting. So all of those things influence our choices and our food behaviors. And so talking more about the foods that fuel the body, they provide a lot of different things for us. They provide the traditional 
nutrients that we think of, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, those are all building blocks for our body, provide us energy. They also provide the micronutrients, vitamins and minerals that help fuel some of this cellular metabolism. And then they have fiber, keep us regular. And then phytonutrients or bioactive compounds. So we'll talk a little bit more about those as we go through. Those are a little bit sort of newer or non-traditional, non-essential nutrients, but still seem to be very important. So we know that it provides energy, building blocks for metabolism, organ and cell functions, regulate metabolism, and many of these traditional nutrients prevent deficiencies. If we don't have, say, ascorbic acid or vitamin C in our diet, we get scurvy. So certainly diet prevents some of these specific nutrient deficiency diseases, but they also play a huge role in promoting health and preventing chronic disease. So that's really the focus of today. And in relationship to that, there've been some studies that have been done over the years, looking back at health statistics for the United States. And so a um, couple studies done in 2018 and 13, this graph summarizes some of that. And this is the state of the United States health looking back from 1990 to 2016. That's the last time this data was summarized. The graph on the, the right-hand side shows on the top um, risks, risk factors related to death, and on the bottom graph, risk factors related to disability. And so you can see where there's blue arrows, dietary factors. So diet and um, diet health are at the very top. They're among the top three to four risk factors for death and disability. And that includes death and disability from cardiovascular disease as one of the leading causes, as well as cancer and other things. So we know that individuals in the United States are living longer, but maybe some of us not necessarily in good health. So about 45% of the deaths and the disability are attributed to risk factors. Diet contributes up to 14% and obesity up to 11%. And we know that diet and our body weight are interrelated. So it's a little hard to parse those out, to sort those out, but um, basically the bottom line of the information we have and for this slide is that diet contributes a significant amount, if not one of the most important factors for chronic disease risks. So these are not um, deaths related to traffic accidents, that type of thing. These are more chronic, non-communicable type of diseases, diabetes, heart disease, cancer. So focusing on cardiovascular disease, we know that there's a number of risk factors for cardiovascular disease, some of which we can't modify. Those are our age that keeps moving on. Um, and our sex, we can't change that. Um, family history, we also can't necessarily change, but somebody who has family members who died early before 45 or 55 years of heart disease, that constitutes a family risk of premature heart disease. But those that we can modify are things such as hypertension, and we can address that through diet, through exercise, as well as medications the blood lipids, total cholesterol, LDL, triglycerides, those can also be modified, again, through diet, lifestyle, and um, medications. Low HDL, so um, low HDL is a risk factor. We tend to think more about high LDL and high total cholesterol, but low HDL can also be a risk factor. That is a little bit more difficult to modify, but we can work on it through lifestyle and medications. Cigarette smoking, certainly a lifestyle factor. Um, diabetes is a um, related disease that contributes to cardiovascular disease. So helping to keep diabetes, if you have it, under control. So keeping blood glucose in the as close to normal range as possible is something that can be modified. And then just overall lifestyle. And so diet fits into that category as well as influences each of those modifiable risk factors in that list. So diet is really critical. In terms of ideal cardiovascular 
health that's usually characterized as the absence of cardiovascular disease and by looking at biochemical things that the, uh, your physician may test in the lab that you have normal or low total cholesterol, blood pressure, fasting, blood glucose. And then they also wanna focus on favorable health behaviors. Those are those things we really just talked about, lifestyle, so not smoking, keeping your body weight in a healthy range, physical activity and diet. So diet, diet, diet keeps coming up. And so those lifestyle modifications, decreasing weight if you're overweight, smoking, limiting alcohol, having aerobic exercise, getting out and walking or swimming or whatever you like to do, and that healthful diet. And so characterizing now, beginning to talk about what that diet is, variety of foods, that was one of those things that you all identified as being critical. So absolutely, particularly fruits, vegetables, whole grains, keeping your sodium intake moderate. That doesn't mean you can't ever have any sodium again, but keeping it moderate. As a population, we typically eat about three times what we need in terms of dietary sodium. And then we tend to focus on sodium, but other parts of the diet are also important in terms of minerals. So balancing modest sodium with relatively higher intake of potassium, calcium, and magnesium is important. And where do those potassium, calcium, and magnesium come from? Mostly from fruits and vegetables, particularly potassium, from dairy products for calcium, and magnesium comes from fruits and vegetables and whole grains. So those are other components of a healthy diet. So let's translate this into food patterns and what that may mean. So you've all most likely heard about dietary guidelines for Americans or other types of food pattern recommendations, the DASH diet, American Heart Association diet, they all look at total diet patterns. For the dietary guidelines in particular, they last came out in 2015 and cover the 2015-20 period. Right now, um, the scientific community is focusing on dietary guidelines for the 2020 to 2025 period. And those should come out in the coming year in the early part, hopefully, or spring of 2021. And there's a few tweaks, but for the most part, the basic messages are pretty much the same. So we'll talk about those. And the basic messages of dietary guidelines are that you need to eat for health and for the long run. So not necessarily making one change and thinking, okay, I'm done with, with making modifications to my diet, but really viewing it not as a diet, but as a lifestyle. What can we do for the foods we eat for a lifestyle for the rest of our diet? Less rest of our life to promote health and to make small changes for success. So the focus is on a variety of foods, nutrient density, and healthy eating patterns. And so nutrient density means go for those things that are rich in nutrients such as vitamins, minerals, fibers, and things, and avoid those things that we think of as empty calories. So empty calories are the high sugar foods, those that are highly processed. So empty calorie foods, think French fries, Coke, um, that type of thing. Nutrient dense foods are a lot of nutrients per few calories. So fruits and vegetables, whole grains, um, meats and protein foods are also nutrient dense. So healthy eating patterns, what's exactly is a healthy eating pattern? It really consists of all the foods and drinks that you consume. And it's something that's flexible and adaptable. It's adaptable to your preferences, culture, budget, traditions, and includes lots of nutritious foods. Um, and in the opposite side, sort of what do you limit within a healthy eating pattern? Some fats that are considered Less healthy, more likely to cause some heart problems might be trans fats or saturated fats, as well as looking at avoiding excess sugars and sodium. So that, in a broad set of terms, is what a healthy eating pattern is. And the main point I want to make in this regard is that food choices matter. You can talk about a healthy eating pattern, 
And you can say, well, I'll eat lots of fruits and vegetables, but it's still your choices within that group and how those foods are prepared. For example, um, if you choose iceberg lettuce, yes, you're eating a green vegetable, but that may not be as nutrient dense as other choices such as spinach or romaine lettuce. So choices even within a food group. The food source and how it's prepared can give you different profiles in terms of fiber, micronutrients, extra calories, depending on how it's prepared or sugar content. So examples, whole wheat bagel versus a donut. I think it's probably pretty obvious that a donut has a lot more sugar versus a whole wheat bagel or whole grain pasta versus regular pasta. French fries versus baked potato, baked fish versus fried fish and chips. And so that doesn't mean that you can never have some of those other foods, but more just what are your usual go-to choices, making the smarter choice and still letting yourself have some of those enjoyable foods now and again. So characteristics of a heart healthy diet, they tend to be diet patterns that are associated with decreasing risks of cardiovascular disease, such as hypertension, heart attack, stroke, atherosclerosis, that type of thing. And examples of that are the American Heart Association diet, the dietary approaches to stop hypertension DASH diet, sounds like you all are fairly familiar with that. Um, Mediterranean diet, which we'll talk more about. Vegetarian diets can fit in there. And then the MyPlate, and the MyPlate icon is over on the side and you can Google that on the web and find information about it. And the strongest scientific evidence in the literature exists for the DASH diet and for the Mediterranean diet for protection against heart disease. And so there's no single best diet, but what hopefully the, the message is that I'm trying to get across is that diet patterns matter and then your choices within that pattern matter. But that pattern needs to be sustainable for your lifestyle, for your tastes. And so in general, we can talk about common characteristics being healthy diet and heart healthy diet in particular is rich in plant foods, fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, has a variety of protein sources, including eggs, fish, lean meat, poultry, legumes, nuts and seeds, beans and so forth. And it doesn't have to be vegetarian. If that's what you prefer for whatever reason, whether environmental, or religious or other choices, that's terrific. But we have seen scientific literature shows that good choices within the protein sources of lean meats and fish and poultry can still be just as heart healthy and protective. Um, heart healthy fats, polyunsaturated and monounsaturated. So we'll talk a little bit more so we don't go on about some of those heart healthy fats that you want to know about and then limiting some of those things that we've already mentioned, the excess sugars and sodium and various hydrogenated fats or solid fats. So challenges, we all would like to eat a healthy eating pattern, but sometimes it seems like it take, takes a lot of work. Um, and the US population still, the data shows that on average people eat maybe two servings of fruits or vegetables a day. So it's still pretty low compared to some of those recommended patterns that are looking at five, six, and seven um, servings a day. Intake of olive oil is somewhat low in, in our pattern as opposed to the Mediterranean diet. And we usually eat most of our proteins as animal sources. So factors that may limit people's ability to eat some of these dietary patterns are, are just usual habits and and that's a big factor, our tastes, availability of foods, shopping areas, budget. And I like the graphic on the, the right is instead of a pill bottle, we've got the stock of broccoli that has um, a prescription on it, you know, take daily for health. And so um, the goal of healthy eating is to make small changes so that even if you don't like broccoli, you can find something else that you can eat daily. So the DASH diet that was mentioned, 
I won't spend a whole lot of time because it sounds like most of you are somewhat familiar with it, but this is a DASH eating plan. And probably if you've gone to your doctor anytime lately, they've said you should eat a DASH diet. So you can also Google a DASH diet and it will come up with a lot of suggestions, some eating patterns, some sample menus and so forth. This is just a, a, a sample eating plan. And I'll just direct your, your attention to the left side of the graphic. It just shows you how many daily servings. And this is for 2000 calories a day. It may be more than some of us as women can eat a day. So you'd adjust it downward slightly, but um, you can see that it's rich in grains and grain products, so whole grains, vegetables, four to five servings, fruits, four to five servings. Uh, it tells you about what a serving size is some low fat dairy foods, some proteins, including nuts and dried beans, some good healthy fats and a few sweets. So it's still a flexible diet. And the, the evidence for this is based on science that control that compared what they called a control healthy diet. So that's on this left-hand side, about 37% fat, modest fruits and vegetables, meat, little dairy, um, to a diet that was rich in fruits and vegetables, still high in fat, and then to the DASH diet that was a little bit lower in fat, had lots more fruits and vegetables, a little bit less meat and emphasizing nuts and beans and dairy. And what they found was pretty dramatic. This has been one of the most successful diet intervention trials that has ever been done, that in all sorts of population, and this included, included ethnic diversity, of African Americans and others as well, that following the DASH diet was able to lower blood pressure by about five millimeters of mercury, so about five points, systolic and three points diastolic. And the fruit and vegetable, just increasing fruits and vegetables, even on still a higher fat diet and so forth, still was helpful, but the DASH diet was best. And when they then layered on that, looking at asking the question, okay, the DASH diet is great. Does it make a difference if I lower my sodium in addition to that? And what they found was that the sodium did make a difference. The blood pressure lowering was the greatest on the DASH diet, but when you lowered salt in addition to that, it was even more effective. But even if you're not able to meet all the, the guidelines for a DASH diet, even if you lower your sodium, it does help to bring blood pressure down. So those two recommendations, lowering sodium, if, if you are eating a lot of sodium already, lowering the sodium and following the DASH diet are the mainstay of how to try to lower blood pressure without medications. And sometimes we still do need medications, but diet can make a difference and it can help those medications work so you don't have to take quite so many. So strategies to lower sodium, um, if you're eating out, which we're not doing quite as much right now because of COVID, but if you do eat out, often the um, portions and the way the cooking is done in restaurants is pretty high in sodium. So the serving sizes are also pretty large. So downsizing portions. So high calories, high sodium, if you eat smaller portions, either share with somebody else or take part of it and take it to go and bring it home for another meal, that can lower your sodium. Another way is choosing to fill half your plate with fruits and veggies because veg fruits and vegetables typically are lower in salt and higher in potassium. And so just doing that can help lower your sodium. The other is um, look at what you're eating. If it's prepared foods, and you have a box that you can look at or a label to look at, look at those labels and see what it says for sodium content and choose one that has a lower sodium. When you're cooking at home, avoid using highly processed ingredients and try to cook from scratch more or just limit the amount of salt that you put in the items that you're cooking or take the salt shaker off the table. You can also if you're using canned beans and vegetables, you can choose a lower sodium version. There's lots of lower sodium. They don't have to be salt free, which does taste pretty bland, but lower sodium versions are available. A lot of canned foods, a lot of frozen entrees, 
So those are great choices. Just avoiding cured meats like lunch meats and bacon and other highly processed foods also helps. And just knowing that as you begin to cut down on your sodium or choose other versions, it does take time to retrain your, your uh, taste buds. It may take several weeks, but um, for myself, and I've had people tell me once they get used to slightly lower sodium, and again, it's not salt-free, it's lower sodium, as they begin to get used to it, then if they go and, and have something like bacon, it just sort of hits you in the face. It's like, wow, all I can taste is the salt. Uh, so your taste buds will get retrained and, and you'll begin to adjust how things taste to you. And then adding herbs, herbs and spices. Mrs. Dash is salt-free. Um, and so that's a great choice. Just adding a little bit of lemon juice or something else like that to really add a, a pop of flavor can really help too. So lots of different tips and tricks. Heart healthy facts. So typically heart healthy facts, fats, excuse me, tend to be unsaturated fats. These are polyunsaturated or monounsaturated. And they tend to be ones that keep the, your LDL and your total cholesterol low. So one way to um, see that fats are heart healthy or unsaturated or monounsaturated is that they're usually liquid at room temperature. And so you can find these on the shelf in the grocery store. There's a lot of examples listed on the slide here. Canola oil is a great choice. It has some omega-3s as well as, as other choices. Olive oil is a wonderful choice, um, but other oils, if you prefer the taste of them, are also good too. Food sources that are uh, fat rich, that are healthy fats are avocados, walnuts and other nuts, as well as, as fatty fishes. So healthy fats come from nuts and seeds, cold water fishes, and particularly avocados, walnuts and other nuts, but walnuts is particularly high, almonds. Uh, so those are unsaturated fats that are great choices. The saturated fats are the ones that tend to raise LDL and increase the risk of heart disease. Saturated fats tend to be solid at room temperature and tend to be found in animal products. So that tends to be the marbling, the fat you can see in the meats, butter and full fat dairy products. And so I'll make a comment here. We used to think that all of your dairy products, the recommendation was you have to go to skim milk, you have to take away all dairy fat as much as you can and we're beginning to find in the science literature that it's a little bit more nuanced than that. So some fats in dairy can be somewhat good for you and protect, protective. And so um, the, some of the full fat dairy products like in yogurt, full fat dairy yogurt seems to be pretty good for us. Um, if you can stay with sort of 1% or 2% fat milk, that's great. You don't have to go all the way to skim milk. Um, butter, occasional butter, I know it tastes good. I, I do eat some butter, a little bit of butter. Just trying to cut away some of the visible fats on meats can help. Those other fats that also tend to raise LDL and be bad for your heart health are listed at the bottom that are hydrogenated oils such as Crisco or palm oil. It's a tropical fat that does tend to be bad for your heart. And coconut oil, that's something that there is a lot of misinformation out about coconut oil. It's still a popular oil and fat, and there, it was super popular several years ago, still pr pretty popular. It is true that it has medium chain triglycerides in it, which are okay for your heart. However, it also has saturated fats in it and it seems to be intermediate in its effect between something like Crisco and something like a, an olive oil or a uh, corn oil. So it's not as bad as Crisco, but it's certainly not as good as olive oil, canola oil. It is a partially saturated fat. So my recommendation is typically not for coconut oil, unless you use only small amounts of it. 
So the Mediterranean diet, this is a very popular diet. It is widely adapted, of course, in different parts of the world. In the United States, it's not as easily adapted by some of our population. We're not used to eating quite as much olive oil, but it's, um, it's easily visualized on the right-hand side in this pyramid, in the bottom of the pyramid showing some physical activity, but looking at the foods, its base is really fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. And then above that is emphasizing fish and seafood as most of the uh, protein sources. And then some other protein sources added in such as poultry and eggs and cheese and yogurt. And then at the top, red meats, particularly processed red meats and sweets less often, and including a little bit of wine in moderation so really at its base is lots of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, olive oil, fish and seafood. And one of the largest diet studies ever to have been done, looking at about 6,000 adults, um, has shown over a period of five to seven years that this Mediterranean diet pattern is a very healthy diet pattern and it results in lower risk of heart disease less type two diabetes, lower risks for that, and other positive health outcomes. And so it really is a very powerful dietary pattern and strongly recommended. So as we make transitions in our diet, some of the changes that we can make to adapt a Mediterranean diet can be substituting maybe olive oil instead of corn oil, or substituting more fish and seafood instead of red meat choices and including, of course, lots of fruits and vegetables. So another question is eggs, are they good or bad? So is it sort of like on the, the graphic on the top here, is it egg an angel or does it have horns on it? And so there've been lots of recommendations over the years that since the eggs are high in cholesterol, that we should avoid them. And um, that has been the my main recommendation for many, many years. The scientific evidence that we know now says that maybe that's not the whole story. So in 2015, the recommendation for dietary guidelines really looked in total at dietary cholesterol and what does it do for heart disease risk. And they recommended removing the recommendation to restrict dietary cholesterol. We do know that eggs are the richest source of dietary cholesterol of all the different things that we eat. Um, so that has been the target. It, one egg has about 170 to 185 milligrams of cholesterol. So we know that dietary cholesterol isn't the main driver of our cholesterol. It really has more to do with genetics and other factors. In some individuals, dietary cholesterol can make that worse, but for most of us, Dietary cholesterol does not cause heart disease. And so the recent evidence is that eggs can be included in the diet of all adults and older adults. And so to test this a little bit, my, um, my lab group did a study over several years where we looked at egg consumption in slightly overweight, mildly hypercholesterolemic postmenopausal women. And so we took 20 women and we fed them two eggs a day at breakfast for four weeks. And we had two different arms and it was randomized and the women didn't know what types of eggs they were eating. So for two or for the first part of the study for four weeks, half the ladies started on two real whole eggs every day for breakfast. And the other half were given yolk-free eggs, like egg beater. And it was prepared all the same way. They couldn't tell the difference. We gave them breakfast every day. And then they ate the rest of their meals at home and just avoided other sources of eggs. So their regular diet, for four weeks they ate whole eggs, for another four weeks, egg beater. The results? we really didn't see very much difference in their blood lipid levels. Whole eggs did not cause changes in blood cholesterol. 
and there were only slightly different changes in HDL lipid. And actually, it didn't change the numbers of people's HDL, but it increased the functionality of that HDL in a positive way that maybe will help our bodies get rid of cholesterol from our arteries a little bit. So in summary, whole legs did not cause problems. It was not an adverse dietary um, impact on these women and seemed to be okay. So this supports other literature that's out there now saying eggs are not necessarily the devil like we thought it was. So if you would like to eat eggs, most people are okay with including it. If you have severely high cholesterol and are on medications, then maybe it might not be as good an idea. And there's still some concern for individuals that have diabetes that maybe the interaction with eggs and diabetes might be a little bit more problematic there. But for most of us, eating eggs is okay. So what about superfoods? That's sort of a catchphrase. This tends to be things like berries and uh, leafy greens. Kale has been a superfood, other items. And so um, often they're touted as something that's miraculous that can solve um, our dietary and health problems. Um, they are great foods. They're super nutrient dense. They have things that are great for us, but they're not miracle foods, but they are good to include in our diets. Fermented foods. So that's something that's really popular now. So um, we know that, that foods interact also with our gut bacteria and fermented foods have some pro-bacteria in them themselves. And so fermentation preserves the foods, it adds taste profile, and it also provides some beneficial microorganisms. So that would be things that are, are pickled at home um, or things that have kimchi, uh, still has live microorganisms, yogurt or kefir that have live microorganisms, kombucha, these are probiotics. They have live beneficial microorganisms, most of which survive down to our gut, not all of them, but some do, and they tend to help promote our health. And these differ from prebiotics, which is like the food components for our gut microorganism, and that would be fiber. And so are vegetarian diets better than Mediterranean diets? Um, or better than um, non-vegetarian diet. So there was a CardiVeg study that compared and both of these diet patterns were effective. So it seems as though from this study as well as other studies that you can uh, include diet, and, sorry, you can include protein foods and animal foods in your diet. A vegan diet is not necessarily better than a vegetarian diet and is not necessarily better than a Mediterranean diet. All can be healthy patterns. The MIND diet is one that's also out there, and it's actually very, very similar to a DASH diet and a Mediterranean diet. You can see that it has recommendations for lots of whole grains, lots of fruits and vegetables, leafy greens, berries, beans, and really it, it's very, very similar. It is a Mediterranean diet or a DASH diet um, for all intents and purposes and just eating less of the, the things that we've talked about avoiding. So linking the quality of our diet to health outcomes, it includes not only those traditional nutrients, vitamin, minerals, but those that are called phytonutrients or bioactive components. And those phytochemicals are the ones that are coming from the fruits, the vegetables, cocoa products, whole grains and be beverages, and so those are the ones that interact with our gut microbiota and our gut bacteria. And so just a graphic, you may have heard lots of, of terms about flavonoids, anthocyanins. Anthocyanins are the red pigment in berries. Uh, flavonones come from citrus. Quercetin from onions and apples. Soy foods have isoflavones. Dark chocolates have flavanols and various other components. These polyphenols also include the cruciferous vegetables, those from olive oils and elagic acid. So 
a wide variety of lots of really tasty foods. And so the biologic effects, the mechanisms that occur due to these various um, compounds that we've been talking about, both traditional and non-traditional, is that they do interact with our genes. There's diet and gene interactions. They act at the cell level with cell signaling mechanisms, and they work with our gut microbiota. And altogether, these do things like improve our lipid profile, decrease inflammation in our body, improve endothelial function for our vascular system, improve our hormone levels and increase insulin sensitivity, um, have other metabolic changes, in circulating metabolites. And so they do link with health outcomes. We know that from large studies, such as the nurses health study, health professional study, they also always show that people that have the healthiest diets have healthier lifestyle, have decreased risk, but they also show that those who have genetic risks are also more susceptible to the beneficial effects of healthy diet. So we can't just throw up our hands and say, well, I have genetic risk and therefore all is lost. Nope. If we eat a healthy diet, we even have better effects of that healthy diet to decrease our risk. And strong association with other health outcomes, that's been seen in many multiple national uh, cohorts, multi-ethnic cohorts, both within the United States and overseas, that these healthy diets are not just about cardiovascular health, they're also about diabetes prevention, brain health, and weight management. And so as we've been talking about diet, you've probably been hearing a lot about precision medicine. Well, there's also precision nutrition and personalized nutrition. We've been talking about the dietary habits and food behavior, these things over here on this right-hand side of the graphic and alluding to things like our genes. So nutrigenomics is a factor, our gut microbiota is a factor and metabolites that circulate in our body. So right now, a lot of these things we know about on a research level, and we're not quite ready for prime time to apply all of them to make precision nutrition a reality, but it's coming, it's the future. But for right now, we need to focus on what can we do to put scientific knowledge and evidence into action to make a difference in our health. And so it's really at the level of behavior change and what choices you make. And so making a set of choices that's achievable for you, that small choices one at a time to institute healthy habits that make a healthier you. And behavior change is hard, but breaking it down into small choices and things that fit you, your lifestyle, your tastes, your health needs, and other considerations that you may have in terms of culture, environmental sustainability, religious background and so forth. So the next couple slides just summarize all that we've talked about in terms of putting it into place for your diet, of eating a variety of foods, choosing healthy whole grains and some of those choices um, that are, are individual food choices, eating more fruits and vegetables, filling half your, your plate with colorful fruits and vegetables, those that are yellow and orange and, and deep green, and making choices that are sustainable for you, eating more salads, and then adding a wide variety of protein sources, and that can include eggs, poultry, lean red meats, lots of beans and peas, nuts and seeds are great for you. If you like tofu and other soy products, that's great too, including healthy fats, the walnuts and almonds and other nuts, olive oil or canola oil, lots of fatty fishes and avocado, drinking water is a good choice instead of sugary vegetables, trying to include less salt in your diet, including dairy, or if you're lactose intolerant, other sources of dairy foods such as tofu and green leafy vegetables, and then certainly considering choice of, of budget. There's a number of healthy choices that are budget friendly too. So lots of choices, and I hope I've convinced you that you can make healthy choices on a budget that are tasty and that are healthful and easy to include and good for your health. So with all that, 
I'm happy to take any questions and I hope I convinced you of ways to include some um, steps in your diet. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. That was great. You've covered a lot of fabulous information. We've had about 21 questions come in. We okay. only have about seven minutes here. So let's see how we can get, how fast we can okay. get through some of these. Great. Is there a particular type of diet recommended for people with autoimmune issues? Yes, so that's, that's a challenging question because there's many different types of autoimmune -ish, um, diseases, but typically those food choices that can help your immune system fight those diseases and decrease the inflammation are ones that uh, focus on heart healthy fats. So looking at lots of omega-3 fatty acids, those that come from uh, cold water fishes, salmon and so forth, all, as well as those that come from plant foods such as um, almonds, walnuts, olive oil, that type of thing. And then lots of uh, probiotics in your diet as well as leafy green vegetables and, and so forth that can help with dampening the immune responsiveness and increasing your immune health. Okay, great. Is it possible to have fermented foods on a low sodium diet? Mm, good question, because lots of fermentation processes include adding salt and vinegar. You're absolutely right. Um, so it's, I think adding them in sparingly in your diet. Um, yeah, I'm hesitating in answering because it's hard to remove the, the salts from fermented foods, but um, adding them in sparingly, yep. Um, could you yes. comment on the choice of wild caught versus farmed seafood for a healthy dietary intake? Yes, that, that's a question that I think people can look out from many different angles, from the sustainability angle, uh, from a taste profile angle, all sorts of things. Um, I think in general, wild caught fishes are, are the best choice um, for not only for the taste profile, but for environmental sustainability. Um, but there are um, other farmed fishes that are also very healthy. Um, so it's, it's not something that should be avoided. Um, I think what we know, there's been some, confirm, uh, con some concerns about frankenfish and that type of thing for genetically modified fishes. Um, but I think farmed fishes are, are quite safe and, and so forth. So somebody's asked about baked potatoes versus French fries. Are French fries really better? And why would a baked potato be a bad choice? Is that what you said? Ah, I might have misspoken. I'm, I'm not sure that I meant to say French fries are the best choice. So um, that was a big, big um, slip of the tongue if I made that statement. So I apologize. So baked potatoes are the best choice. Um, baked potatoes have less fat in their preparation and you can control what else you add to it, control calories and other fats. Um, the skin of baked potatoes are nutrient rich and baked potatoes are a very healthy choice. French fries are kind of one of those empty calorie choices with lots of extra fats. So um, if I misspoke, thank you for bringing that up so I could clarify that. Shoot, I thought I was gonna be able to start eating French fries. <laughs> Should older adults avoid dairy products altogether? What about Parkinson's patients? Uh-huh. So thank you for all of these different questions. So Parkinson's um, is a, a specific um, disease condition that may have some specific recommendations for it. Um, in general, most older adults are fine to consume dairy products. Um, if you are lactose intolerant, that would be a reason to maybe limit dairy products or find those that you can tolerate well. Some people with lactose intolerance find that they can tolerate aged cheese or yogurt or um, kefir or that type of thing. Uh, for Parkinson's patients, they may find that some dairy products have compounds that interfere with some of their medications, L-DOPA and other items that they may be taking for control of their disease. 
So that may be a question that you need to consult with your registered dietitian or your physician. So is there a negative about tropical oil? Somebody wants to know. Uh, so I did mention tropical oils. So um, coconut oil might be one of those. Also palm oil. So that was really more what I was meaning about tropical oils. Um, even though it's a plant source and it seems like it would be a um, polyunsaturated and healthy oil, palm oil actually has a different um, fatty acid composition in that it is mostly saturated. And that's used in a lot of uh, commercial preparation of foods. So sometimes on prepared cookies and crackers and that sort of thing, you'll see palm oil uh, listed or tropical oils. And so um, that's similar to trans fats and hydrogenated fats. They all tend to raise LDL and total cholesterol. So that's part of the recommendation for trying to avoid um, prepared convenience foods. Okay, so somebody asked, why is, the, is margarine included in the DASH diet since margarine is a processed food? Mm. Yes, thank you. So margarine is a processed food. Um, there have been rules and regulations over the last 10 years or so as, as the information came out about um, trans fats and how they're damaging to the effect, uh, damaging to the health, um, regulations for the food industry forced them to change some of their food preparation guidelines. And so uh, it used to be that um, margarines included lots of harmful trans fats. They now are prepared in a way such that they are very low in trans fats. They are a processed food um, but they do not include some of those harmful trans fats. So I think it really is up to personal choice if you wish to include margarine or if you prefer the taste of butter or they have now some butters that are mixed with olive oil or corn oil that provide you a little bit of sort of a, a mix of both. So a good taste profile, but not quite as much saturated fats. Okay, I think that's about all the time we have for questions today. Thank you so much to everybody that sent in the questions. So sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but uh, great information. And this will be recorded, so you'll be able to see it later. Great. Thank you, Dr. Steinberg. And thank you, Christy, for handling the Q&A. My pleasure. Um, as Christy said, today's presentation has been recorded. Um, she was talking about nutrient density. This uh, presentation was uh, very information dense. So if you'd like to go to the, uh, our website uh, in a few days and, and see the uh, presentation over again, um, it will, there'll be a link on the Renaissance Society webpage. Uh, there we go. Uh, next week, our presentation will be Rob Brinzer, um, SEAL Teams to Civilian Life, Core Attributes to Bridge Life's Transitions. Uh, Rob is an Annapolis graduate and a Navy SEAL. He saw combat in Africa and Afghanistan, and he'll be focusing on the core attributes he learned in the SEAL teams and how those attributes have carried over into a successful um, civilian career. We'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, be sure to sign up for next week's forum uh, before noon on Friday. And uh, we hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Thank you.